Welcome, everybody. Last year, we were told that Eastern was celebrating its 125th anniversary, and departments were encouraged to host events in celebration of that anniversary. I realized that I knew very little about the history of the psychology department and wanted to learn more about it. So this past spring and summer, I spent countless hours in the university archives looking through old catalogs, course offerings, yearbooks, and syllabi from the early days of the department. As I dug further, I discovered that my department is awesome and my research should be shared with the university. This is why we have this event tonight. I've also prepared a very large poster which will be placed in the entrance to the psychology hallway on the first floor of web next week and plan to write a manuscript with Luis Cordon examining the history of the psychology department at Eastern with the psychology field itself. Tonight's event has brought together faculty members. Faculty, please rise to be recognized. Thank you. Our alumni, alumni, please rise to be recognized. Thank you. And our current students, current students, please rise. Unfortunately, our emeritus faculty members were all unable to attend this evening, but let's give them a round of applause too. I hope that you enjoy tonight's presentation on the science of psychology at Eastern, a look back as we move forward. When did psychology begin at Eastern? The answer to that question depends on how you define the beginning. You could define the beginning by when the first psychology course was offered. That was Education 103A, Psychology, first required of all freshmen beginning in fall 1954. This course became Psychology 100 in 1958, which it has remained since. Note that parts of the course description will be familiar even to today's students. Sensation, perception, learning, and motivation are all still taught. Emotions are still taught too, but in conjunction with other topics such as motivation or mental health. Education 103A is the first course labeled psychology, but Social Sciences 100, Foundations in Social Science, seem to combine social psychology and sociology at least one year earlier. Another required course for freshmen in their second semester was Education 104A, Human Growth and Development. This course became Psychology 101 in 1958. From its description, it seems to be a lifespan development course, which was discontinued in 1977. Eastern was very different in those days. First, it wasn't even called Eastern. It was the Willimantic State Teachers College. If you were a student here, you were studying to be a teacher. There were no majors, but every student followed the same curriculum. Education 103A was a required course for first semester freshmen. This picture was taken from the 1953 catalog and shows what a typical classroom of students looked like. The woman in the lower left, I don't know quite what she's so mad at. <laughs> Their lives as students were very different from students today. Campus at that time only had four buildings. The administration building, which we now call Schaefer, and this picture actually dates from the 1950s, and you can see how little it has changed. <laughs> Burr Hall, the women's dormitory, the Knight House, and the Noble School, which has since been converted to a dormitory. The Noble School served as an on-campus laboratory for these teachers in training to practice the skills they were learning in the classroom. Even as late as 1968, nine years after being renamed Willimantic State College, and one year after being renamed Eastern Connecticut State College, the campus was not very large. This map shows that Schaefer remained the classroom administration building, but that a new women's dormitory and student union building, which we now call Winthrop, had been built and opened in 1958. There was also an early childhood building just off Prospect Street where residence halls are today. Faculty offices were located in the Knight House, and Beckert Hall, both of which were originally purchased and used as dormitories for men. 
You could also define the beginning of psychology at Eastern by when its first faculty member was hired. Leo Schneiderman joined the faculty in the 1956-1957 academic year. Leo was a clinical psychologist by training with a background in psychoanalysis. Prior to teaching, Leo worked as a clinical psychologist at the Galesburg State Research Hospital in Galesburg, Illinois, and the VA Hospital in Lebanon, Pennsylvania. He also served in the United States Army Air Force in 1945 to 1946. Leo taught numerous courses that represented his devotion to students and their intellectual advancement. Developmental courses, several clinical courses, American National Character, which one would assume would be a Cold War era pro-America course, but as, was actually just about the typical American personality, and Psychology of Literature, where students psychoanalyzed characters from literary works. Leo was a prolific scholar, writing four books and 57 articles before he retired. Many of these were published in the American Journal of Psychoanalysis, Imagination, Cognition, and Personality, and the Psychoanalytic Review. He also served as Editor-in-Chief of the Connecticut Review, a publication of the Connecticut State University System. In his 47 years of service to the university, he made an impression on the students as they learned psychological concepts, such as Freud's theories. This picture, in the 1967 yearbook, shows two young women smoking on a couch, and the caption reads, Did you hear about Freud's theory on smoking? Students today might be shocked to learn that students in those days could smoke in class. Shocking, I know, right? They could also drink on campus. The campus did not become dry until 1991 due to increases in alcohol-related violence. As further evidence that Leo was beloved by the students, the 1960 yearbook was dedicated to him by the students. He was also awarded the title of Connecticut State University Professor in 1989. This prestigious title is recognition of professional excellence that is retained until retirement. No more than 12 faculty members across the four state universities can hold this honor at any given time. Unfortunately, Leo passed away in September 2011, so he could not be here with us today in person, but I know that he is here with us in spirit. You could also define the beginning of psychology at Eastern by when students could first declare psychology as their major. That was in the fall of 1966. The curriculum then was very different than it is now. Students were required to complete 33 semester hours or 11 courses in psychology. These included six required courses beyond Psychology 100. Psychology of Personality, Social Psychology, Abnormal Psychology, Psychology of Thinking, Culture and Personality, and Psychological Tests and Measurements. Four of these courses continue to be taught today, although of course they have changed through the years. The other two courses, Psychology of Thinking and Culture and Personality, were discontinued and they seem to have been partially reborn. Psychology of Thinking seems to be a forerunner of cognitive psychology, and Culture and Personality has reappeared in our major today as Culture and Psychology, although today's course covers a lot more than personality. Beyond these six required courses, students were required to take five additional courses from a selection of available courses. These included Developmental Psychology, a Lifespan Development course, Psychology of Literature, Psychology of Childhood and Psychology of Adolescence, which remain an integral part of the education of psychology students and Eastern's teachers, Educational Psychology, covering the educative process, Psychology of Exceptional Children, our first course on mental retardation, Behavior Problems in Children, which is now called Psychopathology of Childhood, Social Psychology of Small Groups, which seems to cover some of the same concepts as an industrial organizational psychology course, psychology of social change, just perfect for the 1960s, seminar in psychological theory, which could explore any topic a faculty member wanted, and individual research, because Eastern psychology faculty have a long history of mentoring student research. The current curriculum contains three specializations, standard psychology, child psychology, and psychology of work. A developmental psychology curriculum existed for education students at least as far back as 1972. A specialization in IO psychology began in 1990 
and there was a third mental health specialization from 1990 through 1994. The late 1960s and 1970s brought numerous new courses into the curriculum and faculty required to teach them. Industrial psychology was created in 1968, as was perception, although its focus was on social perception, and it lapsed in 1977 until resurrected by Margaret Letterman. 1970 brought five new courses. Our current Principles of Learning course began as a seminar in theories and problems of learning, and our statistics, experimental psychology, now research methods, physiological psychology, and history and systems of psychology began that same year. At the time, the statistics and research methods courses were not a required part of the curriculum as they are now, but they were recommended for students planning to pursue graduate study. Our Psychology of Gender course began as Psychology of Women in 1975, and in that era there were several experiential courses offered where students could work with individuals at the Mansfield Training School, which educated students with intellectual disabilities. Faculty members today still offer several experiential learning opportunities for students, independent studies, internships, research assistantships, and teaching assistantships. Our alumni have told us that these experiences have helped them secure employment or admission into graduate school. The number of different courses that the psychology department has taught over the years is astounding. I have created an animation to help visualize the periods of boom in course proposals. Many of these courses still exist today, although some have changed their course numbers and or names. Many faculty members were required to teach all these courses. This growth has helped us continue to offer high quality teaching and experiential learning opportunities for students. I begin with the early years. Before Dr. Schneiderman began teaching, and to some extent afterward, additional faculty were needed to cover the courses. Our early psychology and human growth and development courses were taught by faculty from the social sciences and education departments, including Mr. James Tipton, Mrs. Julia Bartman, Mrs. Bet Tyson Chappelle, and Mrs. Betty Tipton, who later became Dean of Women and for whom this beautiful room is named. Betty continued to teach the Human Growth and Development course into the mid-1960s. As the psychology major was launched, additional faculty members were required to teach the courses. Two faculty members from the Department of Education joined the psychology department. One of these was James McDonald in 1964. He taught the developmental courses, clinical courses, and educational psychology. The second faculty member from the education department was Alex Paxton Ferguson III in 1966. He taught several different courses as needed. Additional faculty members were hired at that time directly into the new psychology department. Instructor Marion Fields was with us for a short while, beginning in 1967, teaching our child courses in educational psychology. And Edwin Nebelkoff joined the faculty in 1968. It is Ed who began our statistics and research courses. 1969 brought Alfred Kornfeld. <laughs> Looking through these yearbooks was a wonderful experience. I highly recommend it. Al taught our clinical courses and clinical seminars. 1970 brought Gary Sterner, who taught our learning courses and social psychology. Anne Marie Orza joined the department in 1971. She coordinated experiential learning opportunities at the Mansfield Training School and taught our mental retardation courses as well as psychology of women. We welcomed another faculty member from education into our ranks in 1976 when Nancy Romer, later Nancy Hewlett Kirstead, uh, a school psychologist, taught our developmental courses and psychopathology of childhood. 
The 1980s brought us Marilyn Eichler in 1980, who taught our developmental courses in abnormal personality, and Mildred McIntyre in 1985, who taught industrial psychology, physiological psychology, and personality. Unfortunately, I didn't find any pictures of her in the yearbooks. At this point, you will notice a dramatic increase in hiring. Most of these faculty members continue to teach at Eastern. <laughs> And I apologize, these, uh, the pictures coming up were uh, um, rather small that I had to work with, so they're a little blurry. These ones are from the yearbook, though. Our department today is a dynamic and diverse set of teachers dedicated to the success of our students and the improvement of our teaching. We currently have 16 full-time tenured or tenure-track faculty members. These members represent the many diverse specializations within the broad field of psychology, including behavioral psychology, clinical psychology, cognitive psychology, developmental psychology, evolutionary psychology, health psychology, human factors psychology, industrial organizational psychology, neuropsychology, and social psychology. Throughout the department's history, students have had access to many experiences which help to develop them as students, scholars, and citizens. Perhaps the longest lived experience has been our psychology club, sometimes called the Psy Club, a student organization that promotes the discussion of psychology among students. It began in 1965 and enabled students to work with the mentally ill through the Norwich State Hospital Companion Program. The following year, they even traveled to the annual meeting of the New England Psychological Association. This meeting is still attended by many of our students. In 1978, it's 1978, they even got to meet B.F. Skinner, famous behaviorist at the New England Psychological Association meeting. They also hosted an Alzheimer's awareness event in 2011 and continue to host weekly meetings that include guest speakers who are experts in the various subfields of psychology. Our faculty members have supervised many experiential learning opportunities, student research, teaching assistants, research assistants, and interns. The number of students who have benefited from these opportunities is astounding. Since 2001, there have been 1,526 experiential learning opportunities, 920 internships, most of those supervised by Dr. Jeff Danforth and Dr. Margaret Letterman, 278 teaching assistantships, 150 independent studies, 140 research assistantships, and 38 research field experiences. While every single one of our majors must complete an individual research project in our Methods 2 course, many of our students go on to pursue other experiential learning opportunities. These experiences have enabled our students to achieve success post-graduation by providing them with hands-on experience in research and the field. Our students have served as interns in the Connecticut judicial system, in several school districts, and in mental health settings. Our students have presented their research at local conferences, such as the Arts and Sciences Research Conference and Exhibition held every spring on the Eastern Campus. and Psychology Day, an annual conference for the four Connecticut State Universities.
Our students have also presented their work at regional conferences such as the Eastern Psychological Association, the New England Psychological Association meeting, and the Northeast Evolutionary Psychology Society meeting. They've also presented at national conferences such as the Association for Women in Psychology, the Association for Behavior Analysis International, the National Conference of Undergraduate Research, and the prestigious Posters on the Hill in Washington, D.C. Our students have even been able to publish their work with faculty members. Our students have also benefited from service learning opportunities. Students in Alita Cousins' social psychology class were able to raise $1,700 for charity as they practiced the persuasion techniques they learned in the classroom. Those students also showed increased life satisfaction after the experience. And students in Jennifer Lischinski's psychology of childhood class volunteer in the local community, assisting children in after school programs, the Special Olympics, and the Girl Scouts. Our psychology majors don't just succeed in the classroom, but apply their learning to society outside the classroom. Our students have even been able to apply their learning globally. Psychology recently began offering global field courses where students complete a course abroad. Carlos Escoto, in conjunction with Gita Fao, retired assistant director of health services, took students to Nepal in 2011 to study the healthcare system and its similarities and dissimilarities to Western medicine. A second global field course to Nepal in summer 2015, led by Christy Salters Pedno, will focus primarily on Nepal's mental health care system and its similarities and dissimilarities to Western mental health care. If you're interested in this course, please contact Dr. Salters Pedno. <laughs> summer 2015 will provide another global field course option for psychology majors. Jenna Sisko will be offering history and systems in London in conjunction with a group of students from Quinnipiac University taught by Gary Giumetti. If you are interested in this course, please contact Dr. Sisko. Our students have achieved high honors, such as being initiated into Psi Chi, the National Honor Society in Psychology. Eastern's chapter was founded in 1982 and was first advised by Al Kornfeld. They have also won the Henry Barnard Award, a prestigious honor for seniors who have attained high academic honors and completed significant community service. Only two students from Eastern win this award each year. In 2011, both Barnard Award winners were psychology majors. Eric Serino won a prestigious grant from the National Science Foundation and is attending a doctoral program in the Human Development and Family Studies program at Oregon State University. Michelle Kaczynski just finished with her master's degree in clinical psychology from St. Michael's College. Connor Patros is in his fourth year of a doctoral program in clinical psychology at Oklahoma State University. A 2013 graduate, Isaiah Roby, even won the Ella T. Grasso Distinguished Service Award for his involvement in the Pride Alliance and as student representative to the Diversity and Social Justice Council. The award is given each year to individuals who work to advance women's rights and gender equality. Many of our other alumni have gone on to attend graduate programs in developmental psychology, social psychology, clinical and counseling, health psychology, school psychology, I.O. psychology, forensic psychology, behavior analysis, neuroscience, speech pathology, social work, occupational therapy, criminal justice, and ethics. This is just a sample of some of the programs that our alumni have attended or are attending. In the 60 years since the first psychology course was offered, our department has changed tremendously. Here, at the university's 125th anniversary, we pause to look at our past and ready ourselves for our future. The psychology major remains a popular one. This semester, we have 547 psychology majors. This represents approximately 10% of the student body at Eastern. Since 1989, nearly 3,000 students have graduated with a degree in psychology. An additional 500 have graduated with a minor in psychology. Although the number of students graduating with a psychology degree fluctuates from year to year, since 2000 we have awarded between 91 and 163 degrees in psychology in any given year. Students today are left in no doubt of the critical importance of research to our major. 
Since December 2010, our graduates have earned a Bachelor of Science degree rather than a Bachelor of Arts degree. Our faculty have led the way in piloting new methods of instruction and transformative learning experiences in order to help students perform better in the classroom and develop cultural awareness and empathy for others. Students in Peter Bakiaki's Freshman Diversity Seminar course must place themselves in a setting unfamiliar to them, such as a service for a religion they do not observe, and record their reaction to it. Students report that this experience is empowering, yet humbling. Peter Bakiaki and Melanie Evans use several micro-activities to increase student engagement in the lectures. Sorry. In the lectures. These include, but are not limited to, starting the with a question of the day, a practice used by Alita Cousins as well, a one-minute bio on an important historical figure, quick quizzes, and role play. Students reported that different activities were successful for them, suggesting that a balanced coverage of several of these activities may be appropriate to reach more students. Melanie Evans also uses several aging sensitivity measures, having students attempt to complete routine, everyday tasks while wearing thick gloves and distorting goggles. The activity increases student empathy for the elderly. Alita Cousins, Madeline Fougere, and I created and tested several online tutorials to assist students with difficult concepts and research methods. Finally, Christy Salters Pedno pilot tested peer led team learning, an innovative teaching technique that designated certain students as peer leaders to mentor other students. These students ran weekly laboratory exercises and discussions and assisted students with semester long projects in Psychology 100. These are only some of the techniques our faculty use to promote student engagement and learning. Using techniques like those described here, we have been able to help our students be more engaged in the classroom. One thing I've learned about the psychology department is that we are always improving. In an effort to keep improving, here are some of the things we have in store for the near future. We will soon offer a new concentration in behavior analysis, which will provide students with some of the necessary qualifications needed to seek certification to become applied behavior analysts. Many of our recent alumni have sought certification and are working in the field. We continue to offer experiential learning opportunities for students, and we were recently awarded money from the university to fund student research, including travel to conferences and summer research stipends. We are also creating a one-credit professional development course designed for juniors and seniors. In 2008, when we created the one-credit introduction to the psychology major course, we knew it would be helpful for students to begin to identify potential career paths to pursue and plan for the experiential learning opportunities that would make the, those career paths attainable. We found over the years since then, however, that students often need a lot of mentoring as they begin to pursue their goals as juniors and seniors. While this course will be an elective only and will not replace the one-on-one -on -one mentoring our students receive from their faculty, it will provide students a necessary venue to practice the skills that will help them gain admittance to the graduate program of their choice or enter into the career of their dreams. We are also pursuing the creation of an honors program for our students. This program will likely include additional research or other experiential learning opportunities, special seminars, and extracurricular components such as brown bag research presentations. We strongly desire to create and maintain strong ties to our alumni as a support network. Our Psy Chi Honor Society has recently begun inviting alumni to its induction ceremony in the spring, and we hope to have future events for alumni to attend. Finally, we plan to continue our strong record of student mentoring. Our faculty, our faculty genuinely love to teach and work with students. In the few years students spend with us, we form special bonds with them and celebrate their successes with them. They leave an indelible impression on us. We take great pleasure in cultivating their young minds and developing them into the professionals needed in the field and the thinkers needed in society. By fostering research literacy and critical thinking, we prepare them not just for today's world, but for the world to come. Thank you. At this point in our program, we will hear the personal experiences of several guest speakers. Please welcome to the podium, Dr. Jeff Danforth.
Dr. Danforth is our most senior current faculty member who joined our department in 1992. Dr. Danforth earned his bachelor's degree from Marietta College in Ohio and his master's and doctoral degrees from West Virginia University. He is a licensed child clinical psychologist and maintains a private practice treating children with ADHD and other developmental disorders. He has spent most of his years at Eastern coordinating and promoting our department's internship program. He has titled his presentation, Pride. Please give Dr. Danforth a warm welcome. So you have a five-year-old kid with a fever of 104. Take your five-year-old child to the doctor, and this is real serious at 104. You get brain damage at 105. So the doctor gives your child some medicine, and you say, geez, doctor, where'd you get the idea to use this medicine? And he says, I got an Aunt Betty down in New Mexico, and her daughter was sick like this one day, and she used this medicine, so that's what I picked for your kid. Are you happy? Do you like this doctor? Some of you do. <laughs> um, but really, where do we want our doctors to get their information? Where do you want these pediatricians to get their information? From science. That's where we want people to get information. But really, for too long, we thought about psychology in the way I just described. We held our auto mechanics to higher standards than we held psychology. If you went to the auto mechanic three times and he didn't fix your car, you left and didn't go back. Woody Allen, the movie director, went to the same psychologist for 20 years and then married his daughter. It didn't work, Woody. <laughs> it didn't work. You're not holding psychology to a high enough standard. Psychology is too important for that. Psychology is too important for that. When children hurt each other, that's psychology. When people base decisions on fear and rumor rather than facts, that's psychology. When vets have trouble with PTSD and commit suicide, that's psychology. When we can't teach nurses how to wear a hazmat uniform, that's psychology. When dementia strikes the elderly, that's psychology. When people are unhappy in the workplace, that's psychology. Psychology is too important to leave to Aunt Betty in New Mexico because that's what she did with her kid. For too long we've been focusing on unscientific folklore, testimonials, and so forth. And many people who enter the field and come to our department want to help people. And being a nice person and caring about others is necessary, but it is not sufficient to help people. If we really care about the people we allege to want to help, then we should be basing our decisions on science. And that's why I'm really proud to be a member of the Department of Psychology, because my colleagues recognize the importance of psychology to the human endeavor. And because my colleagues care, and because they want their students to be able to show they care, my colleagues teach psychology through the prism of the scientific method. And to me, that's the highest ethical calling. That's the highest standard. We are proud as a department that since 1992, we've made the curriculum more challenging, adding components of the scientific method. All we have to show for that is 10 additional faculty lines and hundreds more students. When we became a more scientific department, we re and Louis Cordon can, I think, can attest to this, we really took off. We made it harder, we added research methods, we ramped up statistics, we added another research methods courses, and what did we get? More students, not less students, and more students who were better. Um, so I'm proud of my colleagues, past and present, because they encourage students to learn how to, make data, data, learn how to make database decisions, how to think objectively. And when my colleagues teach students to do this, that shows that my colleagues really care about the discipline, because this is a very important discipline, and it should not be underestimated. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Danforth. 
Next, we will hear the personal experiences of Curtis Dara. Curtis graduated in December 2010 with a Bachelor of Science degree in psychology with a concentration in psychology of children and youth. Uh, that was actually the very first semester that we awarded Bachelor of Science degrees, uh, which is pretty awesome. Um, since graduation, Curtis has worked in the Norwich public school system as an applied behavior analysis paraprofessional. Currently, he is working in the Montville School District as a school counseling intern. He is attending the University of Connecticut and will graduate in May 2015 with his master's degree in educational psychology with a concentration in school counseling with a K-12 certification and plans to work at the elementary or middle school level as a school counselor. He has titled his presentation, My Psychology and Internship Experience. Please give Curtis a warm welcome. Hi, <laughs> how are you all today? <laughs> Oops, crazy. Okay, <laughs> I'm so excited to be here. So good evening, distinguished staff, students, and guests. Um, looking at most of the staff members that I had when I was here five years ago, I'm sure you're all sitting in your seats being like, oh boy, <laughs> what is Curtis gonna say? <laughs> okay, so my name is Curtis Dara the Fourth. Um, but I first want to thank the psychology department for welcoming me back to Eastern Connecticut State University to speak on behalf of this extraordinary celebration. It's so good to be back here. I love Eastern. I have told many of my students to come here, and I currently have a sister that come, goes here. I spent two and a half years at Eastern from August 2008 to December 2010. I immediately was taking psychology courses, all from learning one and two, behavioral stats, research methods one and two, and even current research in psychology. And I'm so jealous that you have all these new programs here, and I was like, oh, I would love to take that course. <laughs> um, I was also a tour guide for admissions. There were many classes I took here at Eastern, but I believe I thrived most on the excitement I was getting from the psychology courses from everyone in the psychology department. After my time at Eastern, I worked in the Norwich Public School System for a year as an applied behavioral analysis staff member because of my experience of what I learned in Dr. Diller's Learning 2 course. I became really interested in the autism spectrum and studying the disorder. From taking what you learn in class and using it in the real world, it ultimately ends up making sense. I have Eastern Psychology Department to thank for that. To this day, whenever a topic comes up with stress-induced eating, I tell people, that's what I studied in research methods too. And I was 0.02 away from my hypothesis that of the 200 students that I surveyed at Eastern, that girls tend to stress, stress eat more than males. I couldn't wait for senior year to take the internship course that they offered here. I was so excited because I knew immediately what I wanted to do. I knew I was going to walk across the street to Wyndham High and work closely in the school counseling department to develop behavioral intervention plans as well as perform duties of a school counselor. I also remember hearing Dr. Escoda's voice in the back of my mind saying, you know you're going to have to go to grad school for that? <laughs> and that's eventually what happened. I took internship with Dr. Letterman, Dr. Fitzgerald, and Dr. Dan Forth. And it was a great three semesters of having Curtis Dara on their case alone. <laughs> I was at the same site for three years, and interning at Wyndham High gave me some insight to Title I district schools, working with families with low SES, low attendance rates, and even some pregnant teens. This, the internship allowed me to work closely with administration and other professional staff members as well. It was also a foot in the door into a school system where I knew that this experience is where exactly I wanted to be. So current students, take the internship course. You won't regret it. After graduation, I worked at New London High School as a career center facilitator helping students out with financial aid in college. All the experience I gained for this job I learned in my internship through Eastern and Wyndham High. The 2012 school year I worked in ABA with elementary school students. And it was that fall where I discussed with Dr. Escoto and I told him I would be applying to UConn School Counseling Program. That March, I got a phone call saying I was accepted. And I'm so happy for that. <laughs> I am currently in my last year of three in the pro of the UConn School Counseling Program. And I'm so happy again to be working with sixth, seventh, and eighth graders at Tile Middle School in Montville, Connecticut. 
The past three years have kept me busy with other internships at Kelly Middle School in Norwich and Montville High as well. Upon graduation this upcoming May, I plan on applying for school counseling jobs, working with students, and using data to help move the academic achievement gap to work closely with students on their social and emotional development while providing a college and career curriculum. Now, this dream wouldn't have started if it wasn't for Eastern. I cannot believe that this December it will be five years since I left my last class in the science building. I remember handing my keys to Nutmeg and looking at the building and I'm like, this is it. I'm leaving Eastern and I'm very sad because I would love to be back here and I'm so happy I'm here. I am so thankful to be here representing what a wonderful university Eastern is and the psych department on the 125th anniversary. I currently tell my students that when you truly love what you do, it doesn't feel like work. And I go into my school always with a smile, knowing that I can make a difference in someone's life. When I end my classroom guidance lessons with my students, I always say at the end of the day before that bell rings, one, two, three, you can, and they say change the world. So I hope you all join me when I ask you this. <laughs> one, two, three, you can. Change the world. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Curtis. Uh, finally, we will hear the personal experiences of Joy Zuzel. Uh, Joy graduated in December 2010 also uh, with a Bachelor of Science degree in Psychology and a minor in Spanish. Since graduation, she has completed her master's degree in clinical mental health counseling at the University of St. Joseph. She has worked for over three years as a therapist providing in-home intensive child and adolescent psychiatric services and is working to build a private practice. She has also worked in forensic case management for dual diagnosis adults on probation or parole or who have been found not guilty by reason of mental disease or defect and has also held an assistant teaching position at a private clinical day school. She has titled her presentation, Paying It Forward. Please give Joy a warm welcome. Good evening. Um, it's a pleasure to be speaking with you tonight about my experiences at this great university. Not only were my years of study here transformative, enriching, and fruitful, but they prepared me in ways that I had not anticipated for graduate school and my present career. Um, after graduating Eastern with a bachelor's in psychology, I went on to complete my master's in clinical mental health counseling at the University of St. Joseph's in West Hartford. Um, for nearly four years now, I've been working as a therapist for high-risk youth who are in danger of um, outplacement, detention, or hospitalization. Um, I treat children who are in danger of these outplacements based on severe mental health issues and their families as well. Um, my time at Eastern, prepared me how to, prevent, how to present myself professionally. It also taught me how to formulate a framework of, of conceptualizations and perhaps most importantly, how to carve out my own path. These skills have been instrumental in supporting my clients in helping to carve their own paths for themselves. Knowledge has proven on multiple occasions to be an effective weapon against barriers in both my professional as well as my personal journey and I strive to pass this knowledge on to those who I serve in an ongoing effort towards their wellness and self-actualization. In addition to the academic experiences and merits that I acquired while studying at Eastern, I maintain and value a number of relationships with past professors who I'm honored to now call colleagues. The evolution of this relationship would not have been possible if it were not for the welcoming and supportive nature of this psychology department. What initially attracted me to the university in general when I transferred here was from Manhattan was the intimate culture of the campus, the small class sizes, the personal attention, and the individualized curriculum were inviting and encouraging for a recent Connecticut transplant and a welcome contrast to the sterile anonymity of a mammoth New York City university. These attributes I felt were exemplified by the psychology department, which not only embodied the values of this local liberal arts community, but provided a caliber of instruction which I feel surpassed the already high threshold of the general Eastern faculty. The quality of teaching within this department set a high standard which I would later measure my graduate professors by. And I'm happy to say that 
the psychology teachers at Eastern often came out on top in that comparison. <laughs> My opportunities for learning here were not limited to the classroom alone. Under the guidance of Dr. Diller and Dr. Salters Pednow, I completed research assistantships, which I was able to contribute to doctoral level published studies as an undergraduate. Not only was this privilege, um, not only did this privilege provide deeper insight into the world of research, but the morbid catharsis which resulted from being allowed to subject my fellow students to a lecture of shock proved a much needed stress reliever to an overburdened schedule. In all seriousness, this experience instilled in me qualities which I apply in my current work as a clinical therapist. Dr. Diller and Dr. Salters Pedno taught me how to be a skeptic, or rather they taught me that the word skeptic was not a derogatory term, but instead the mark of a true scientist who insists on being well informed rather than following a trend. This has proved crucial in my work counseling a marginalized community who is accustomed to trusting providers without questioning. Part of my work as an advocate for this community is teaching them how to be advocates for themselves. This requires skepticism. It requires being brave enough to take a second look, to ask questions, and to insist upon better answers. Dr. Evans also deserves a nod for striking the fear of plagiarism deep into my heart, along with the merits <laughs> of APA format perfection. Oh, how I labored over commas, semicolons, and italics, and lived in perpetual fear of accidental plagiarism, which would result in my failure or my expulsion. But this fear pro propelled my professional writing to a level which was more than prepared for graduate work. My classmates in grad school, many of whom hailed from undergraduate universities of greater acclaim, struggled to integrate dozens of research papers into comprehensive reviews in a way that I was accustomed to doing here at Eastern. The focus on research, professionalism, and the dissemination of data were a vibrant theme which weaved throughout the classes in the psychology department. I often use concrete research to bolster confidence, um, to, boast it, to bolster confidence in doubtful clients, and to validate this profession as a whole. I use empirically supported interventions and theories to deliver the most effective and ethical treatment possible, and I credit Eastern with inspiring me to place such a strong emphasis on science in a field that is often plagued with ambiguity. Special credit needs to be paid to the professors who went above and beyond the call of their job description to advise, to inspire, and to mentor me along my path to a professional career. This extra dedication was not only impactful, and commanding of respect, but continues to be an inspiration for myself to go the extra mile in my own work. Again, Dr. Christy Salters Pedno was the first to offer me real life insight into the non academic demands of a professional clinician. She also instilled confidence in my career choice by telling me after one class together, I can already tell that you're going to be a great therapist. Dr. Salters Pedno is equally inspiring as an example of the woman who can do it all. She's a professor, a therapist, and a mother. And she was proof that I could balance career and a personal life. My beautiful, nearly two-year-old daughter, Maribel, is my own testament to this and my greatest achievement. And I'm sorry, Eastern, but you don't get any credit for her. <laughs> Unqualified, uh, unequaled in his influence is Dr. James Diller. My introduction to Dr. Diller was a statistics class. Dr. Diller's own behavioral perspective would have predicted an aversive con conditioned response, but in striking contrast, I sought out and took every class I possibly could with him after my first experience. And this was a statistics class, I'll have you know. Um, his passion for the work, his openness to question and exploration of new ideas rather than rote instruction awakened a curiosity which I've yet to satisfy. It's this curiosity which compels me to go above and beyond in my own work always seeking new answers to new questions, looking just a little deeper, and again, more skeptically, rather than for the easy fixes. I'm very grateful to the faculty at Eastern, particularly the psychology department, and I'm honored to celebrate this impressive anniversary with you. I look forward to seeing the product of your future classes, and I eagerly await the impact that they have on our community. Thank you. Thank you, Joy. I hope you have found this evening's program informative and enjoyable. I would like us to give one last round of applause for our speakers and alumni who have joined us this evening.
please also give a round of applause to our sponsors, the Office of Institutional Advancement, Provost Rona Free, and Dean Carmen Sid. As a token of our appreciation, we have gifts for our speakers. Speakers, would you please join me at the podium? Give them another round of applause. <laughs> They're that awesome. <laughs> if you have any questions about the history of the psychology department, I encourage you to come talk to me. I learned a lot more than I could possibly fit in this presentation, and I've got a stack of paper about this thick in my office, too. <laughs> Uh, I also encourage you to come talk to our speakers, especially those of you who are current students. Uh, our alumni speakers were in your shoes not that long ago, and they'd be happy to talk to you. Uh, and alumni, be sure to say hi to your faculty members before you leave so that we can catch up. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. <laughs>